The following thoughts on Happy Hour do not represent Cox Media Group or its sponsoring. Anything you hear may and will be used against you. Thank you. Voted as best local podcast in Tampa Bay by the Creative Loafing. You're listening to Happy Hour. Are you feeling classy today? Sit down, pour a glass of wine, and listen to Happy Hour. You're tuned in to Happy Hour, an hour where Happy rants about something. Sit back and listen in. Happy Hour is on now. Happy Hour is on now. What up? What is happening? This is Happy Hour. I am your host, Ryan Hoppy. And the next guest I have on the phone line, I am very honored about. Back when I had time in high school, I would watch shows like The Mentalist, CSI Miami, and I grew up watching this guy on CBS 2. You can see him on the 5, 6, and 10 p.m. news on CBS 2 in Chicago. Rob Johnson is on the line. What's up, dude? Hey, man. How you doing? Great to be with you, Ryan. I'm doing great, man. How has everything been? It's so weird because I don't watch local TV here, so I yeah. see everyone's tweets, and I feel like I'm back at home, but I haven't been able to watch for like a year now, so how's everything been? Uh, well, you know what? The great thing about a place like Chicago is there's always something going on, so... There's, there always seems like there's a big story going on. Right now, it's the uh, the lieutenant from Fox Lake up in the northern suburbs yeah. of Chicago who everybody thought got killed. And as it turns out, he killed himself. He staged the crime scene. He was you know, stealing money from the Explorer uh, program through the police department. It's just one revelation after another. And I know a lot of this has made national news. So some of uh, your uh, listeners probably have heard this story, but that's kind of the big one right now. Every day there's something new. And how has the coverage been? Well, I'm guessing in Chicago, everyone's talking about the nine-year-old that got assassinated it's very bizarre. You would think that would be one that would make national news, dude. There has been nothing on any of the major networks or down here. Like, is it just a thing in the Midwest with that poor kid? I, you know what? There's a lot of crime in Chicago, so maybe nationally people go, oh, there's there's Chicago for you. But the, the really horrific thing about this particular story is – that this kid was nine, he was going to a park to play basketball, and then some gangbangers lured him, allegedly, into an alley and basically executed him. And it's just, you know, you keep thinking about the depravity of these gangs and of the crime situation and how it just keeps getting worse, and there are no rules and there appears to be no decency. And then you think about luring a nine-year-old yeah. kid into an alley and – the kid gets shot up. It was just awful. And uh, they had his funeral uh, in the last couple of days in visitation. And I I'm surprised it didn't make national news, even though I know people are sort of tuned out to crime. But this story really hit close to home in so many different ways. What is it like just reporting it every single night? I mean, every major market talks about crime and murder every night, but it has to hit home, dude. I mean, every night you're reporting about drive-bys and murders. Does it ever take a toll on you as a news anchor? Well, I think, yeah. I mean, I, th I think because hopefully you have empathy for the people that are going through this, but I also respect the fact that a lot of people um, who may be watchers of local news say, you know, enough of the crime. Because that's what I hear from my friends and people that I meet in the community. They're like, man, why do you guys cover all that crime? And I can say that we've really made a concerted effort. We have this little original reporting tag that we do. And, yeah. and we've actually come out and we're really trying to cover stories and stay away from the crime and cover the stories that people might care about or something that might be peculiar or more, most importantly because people get their news from their smartphones and their iPads and everything else on a daily basis, we got to come up with stuff that maybe you didn't hear about or read about all day to try to stay relevant because the game's changing so quickly when it comes to the way that people consume their news. Would you say that you do prep 24-7 since you have to keep up with mobile apps? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to sit there and suggest that, you know, at three in the morning, I'm, you know, scouring the, yeah. the websites or whatever. Um, but I, I kind of dip in and out, you know, the, I work nights. So in the morning I'm, you know, having breakfast, take my, my 10 year old to school, come back and yeah, I'm checking out like, what's going on today, whatever. I may look at my uh, work email, you know, which is on my, you know, iPhone 
and uh, and then I may take a little break and go do other things, and then I come back, you know, come into work in the afternoon and kind of plugged in. So I don't want to say it's 24-7, but because you have those iPhones with you all the time, you can get all sorts of information on them, whether it be from your office or whether it's um, information, you are always, yeah, you're always sort of plugged in. I think that's the way it is for a lot of people. Now, I have a second job. I do this podcast and I work at the bone, but I try to find things to do in my free time, like working out, watching yeah. Netflix, going for walks, meditating. Do you try to find free time for yourself since you do three shows in five hours? Do you try to find time <sighs> to have fun? Oh, yeah. I mean, well, first of all, um, it's an odd schedule to have working nights. So what I do during the daytime, like today, uh, I went and um, hung around the house for a little bit, and then I went and played hockey. I, I, I love ice hockey, yeah. So it, and it's a great workout, and so I played ice hockey for like an hour and a half at lunchtime, and then I you know, went home, got cleaned up, came into work. Um, that's a good day, and I might you know, work out at my, you know, at my house or something, but uh, I love playing hockey. In the summertime, I love playing golf. And I always tell people, you know, whether it's this business or another business, you know, especially for younger people who are like so plugged into their careers, I'm like, you you need to find a hobby. You need to find something totally unrelated to what you do in your business and make it something that's a release for you. And so I highly recommend that. And it's something that I have subscribed to for many years to have other things to do. Would you say that everyone that's like my age, like let's say 18 to like 29 or 30 would you yeah. say that like phones and everything like that is taking us over because it just seems like my whole like the whole thing the millennials it just seems like we're always on our phones and we're not appreciating the moment do you see this recent trend where it's just we're not doing things in our free time what do you think yeah, I think I think people. I mean, just walk down the street in any city, yeah, and 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 tr good luck making eye contact with anybody, <laughs> you know, because everybody's everybody's nose is in their phone, and they're they're either on some sort of social networking or they're texting or whatever. And, and listen, I'm guilty of it too, and I'm a little bit older than some of the millennials that are listening to you right now, but um, but that's the way it is. And I think sort of the art of conversation like actually talking to people and, hey, you know, what's going on yeah. in your life and how are you and whatever and face-to-face -face contact or even on the phone, you know, even like a phone conversation. Those are those are sort of few and far between these days. So I don't want to sit here and like, you know, speak to the perils of society because of our phones, but I don't think they've helped when it comes to like real human interaction. Yeah. I think that's sort of taken a back seat to look at me, look at me, you know, I'm a post here. Hey, look where I'm eating lunch. Look where I went uh, – here I went and just bought these new shoes and look at me and look at me and everybody's social networking is sort of um, help people with the whole look at me thing so yeah. now everybody no matter who you are everybody thinks they're a celeb or important or whatever and I mean is it good or is it bad I think it's both what do you think of when let's say the local news or the national news does segments where they show the viewers tweets I'm not the biggest fan of that because, to me, that's just sort of lazy. I mean, it's okay to show a few tweets, but I'm just not the biggest fan of when it, they make a whole segment out of it. I just kind of find it lazy. Like, what do you think? Well, well I think here, here's, here's the thing. All, not all, most millennials don't care about TV. Most millennials aren't getting their news from the news people in whatever town they're in. Yeah. They're getting it elsewhere. And we have – many of us have very loyal audiences that are older, but the people everybody's trying to get and, and trying to be relevant to are people your age, Ryan. And so it's true. what they don't realize is um, that, that, that we already lost them, A, in my opinion. Um, the other important thing to remember, too, is I don't think it's necessarily lazy. I will tell you that sometimes it's a Twitter or Facebook engagement with viewers. It's no longer good enough to have like a lead story or whatever your yeah. big story is that's provocative and say, you know, here I am, Rob Johnson in Chicago on my mountaintop, you know, giving you the news. Because um, people are like, yeah, we don't care. But people do care about themselves. People do care about, hey, Rob asked me what I think about that story on Facebook or on Twitter. And – and I may watch the news because maybe later in the newscast, I know he's, he might put my comment on. So 
it's a, it's a more so I don't know I don't think I don't look at it as lazy Ryan I look at it as trying to engage people in a different way oh you don't really care about what we're doing or what we're saying or what we're reporting yeah you know maybe because everybody like I said before everybody's important right yeah so maybe if we can engage people in that way maybe they stick around and they wait to see if we put their comment on the air whether it be Facebook or Twitter that's kind of the thinking you know behind that at least from where I sit. That's a very good point. I never thought about it that way. And now you're a news anchor, so you have the likable approach online. And I'm a more upfront, I would say, edgy guy. And the people here at the bone, we speak our mind. So we probably receive more hate online with people that wouldn't say it to our faces. But what do you think of this whole thing where they can just hide behind the keyboard and talk smack? I just oh, kind of it. think it's sort of lame, and it's becoming a problem. Well, it is, and I think it's getting worse. I mean, uh, you know, the, the trolls out there that – and I just close my eyes, and I imagine they're in their pajamas with their little <laughs> slippers on and their cup of coffee or their beer or whatever, and they can say whatever they want to to anybody at any time, and it's out there. Now, yeah, you can block it on Twitter or Facebook or whatever – but it's just, you know, again, it's another way where social media has really um, – that, that's one of the bad sides of it. Oh, yeah. Anybody can say anything, and there's no accountability. There's no – like, how do I go – and how do I go engage that guy? How do I can, I – can I call that person? No, because they're hiding behind their computer screen or their, you know, phone or whatever. Well, here, basically, we're just told don't say anything, Dom – And if you're outspoken, you better know how to back it up. So I'm careful online while I keep it outspoken. Are there rules for you on what to post on social media? Oh, I mean, are there rules? I mean, um, there are rules of, like, common sense. That's true, yeah. So I I wouldn't say that there's, like, a, a little, you know, email that's sent out and here's what you must say and here's what you must not say. There's none of that. Yeah, there is. There's a concerted effort to get behind and help, you know, promote other people's stories, you know, special reports and that sort of thing. But when it comes to social media, it's just like, hey, don't be dumb. Don't 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 engage people in a negative way. And when people start trolling you and start, you know, trying saying horrific things or rude things or whatever the case may be, don't engage them. So that's that's I think that's common sense for anybody. That's a very good point. I never thought about that. And have you ever had any crazy fans or like threats online that became bad or since you're a very likable news anchor do you not really receive that no i mean i think i think there are crazy people out there um that may think they you know have a relationship with you that they don't yeah and i and, and i think you have to be careful of that and some of that's online i've gotten phone threats before really you know years ago um, I know people around here on occasion have to deal with people. So some of these people will write them letters, the old snail mail letters, that sort of thing. Some of them will do it online. So I think as an organization, I think we got to keep it pretty, you know, we got to be careful of, of what we're doing and, and making sure we know who's who when it comes to that sort of engagement and then make sure that we're, you know, protected. But we don't walk around like, oh, my gosh, yeah. you know, I'm in danger. I mean, that, that would be overstating it for sure. Has that ever happened, though? Have you ever done a report in maybe a bad part of town? Were you ever nervous, or did you ever see anything? Because I'm always fascinated by that, Rob, when you see news anchors doing the reports in bad neighborhoods. Have you ever done that, or have you heard about something? Oh, yeah. I mean, back back uh, years ago when I was reporting uh, uh, and anchoring the weekend news at one of the other stations in Chicago, you know, we get sent to like, hey, the shooting in the in the in the bad part of you know one of the bad neighborhoods. Yeah. But I will say, and I and I remember feeling threatened by people. Maybe maybe a group in a community got a little excitable, and then they were mad, and they were mad at somebody they got killed, and then we were there, and then they got mad at us. And so I would say that all the people I've ever worked for, they're like, listen, if you feel unsafe, if you feel like that's not a good place to be, you get out of there. And so nobody's ever said you're going to stay there and do that report, you know no matter what. Now, I want to ask you this. I haven't been in town for a year, so I wasn't there for when he got re-elected and he beat out Chewy. But what is your overall take on Rahm Emanuel 
I despise him, and I know no one could really go into that seat and do much. But, dude, there's something about that guy, man. Maybe it's because he got mad at a movie, but I just I don't like Rom. What do you think? Well, I, you know, I will say this, and, you know, I have to cover these guys on a daily basis, so, uh, you know, I, I, I try to be fair with all of them. And I will say that he inherited a really bad situation when it comes to the monetary um, situation here in Chicago. Yeah. And he's had to make a lot of tough choices, and now there's no money anywhere, state level, city level, you name it. You know, there's no money anywhere. And there's nowhere to hide. There's no way to pad, you know, to to put, you know, take money over here and put money there now. And so now he's having to make some tough situ- some tough choices. Um, so he 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 was he moved he went into a pretty tough situation. That's true. And it hasn't gotten any easier. And you know, I know that he can rub people the wrong way, but you know, I've I've seen him out at various charity events in recent months, and you know, we've gotten along, you know, just fine. And and I and I. You know, I know that not everybody thinks he's a great guy, and I know uh, you know he's rubbed people wrong in the past, but but um, he's a pretty smart guy. And now, what's it like when you meet him at an event? Is it like weird, or is it one of the things where you just sort of get used to it? Oh no, we. I mean, you know, we we see each other. Hey, Mayor, how are you, Rob? Good to see you. How you know? How's your family? How's your you know that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, at a recent event, he stayed a little longer than he normally does. So we were able to chat a little bit longer and, you know, talked about the business, talked about a lot of the things we're talking about here, about how people are getting their news in different ways now and, and that sort of thing. And so, um, yeah, you're just, just, you know, hanging out and talking to the mayor. And now I've wanted to know this. Is it weird? Maybe you're out to eat or you're at a nice event. Is it weird when you maybe see your rival or people from other networks, or do you guys go up and talk to each other? What's that like? I think everybody's uh, collegial to each other. I think everybody respects the job the other people have to do. I'm not going to say I like everybody in town. You know, they're all you know great guys and, and women. Um, but I would say there are a number of them that I do respect and like. And if I see them, you know, I you know give them a hug and you know chat them up and you know, have a good time with them. So I, you know, it just depends on the person. It doesn't really depend on the station or the fact that you're rivals. It depends on the person and how your, your interpersonal dealings have been with them in the past. Do you think there's some guys that when they get in that seat and they get to talk to the town every night, does it sort of build a big ego where they forget where they came from? Have you seen that before with oh, maybe sure. some anchors? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's I think I think it's it's possible a lot of people uh, do that and uh, and something that I try to remember because I'm very blessed to have the have a terrific job being a main anchor in Chicago is that um, you know that's why I do a lot of stuff in the community and do a lot of charitable work because I love where I live I love the people that are here and and I want to be part of it and but I do think a lot of people once I've seen them do this before they get there and then they're sort of like hey you know not so involved anymore and kind of just do their own thing and and there's probably some disconnect there and what are some of the things that you do to help out chicago what are some of the events you work on well i have a brother who has down syndrome uh, who lives in little rock arkansas so i've always uh, disability uh, advocacy has always been top of my list and i serve on three boards I'm on the Concussion Legacy Foundation. They're the they're the group out of Boston that you know kind of you know, they have the brain bank for the deceased athletes, and they're the ones that have kind of uh, really raised the profile on the whole idea that uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy (CTE) is a real thing and it exists in people that have received repeated head trauma over their lives, whether it be athletes or other people. Um, I'm also on the Special Olympics Illinois board, and I'm on the board of Hockey on Your Block here in Chicago, which uh, allows inner-city kids to play the game of hockey. So we help get them ice time and, and put them on teams and give them equipment. And we want, you know, we want to grow the game of hockey. You know, I love it so much. I want everybody to play it. I want everybody to play it. So those are some of the things I'm really passionate about, and so I help groups all the time. Last night I emceed an event uh, for this Positive Coaching Alliance. They have various chapters all over America, and it's basically trying to instill uh, positive influences on the coaches that are coaching our our kids, and uh, five kids won big scholarships last night from it. So that's just something I did last night. So I'm pretty, yeah, pretty involved. 
You do so much, man. Do you ever find yourself burning out, or is it one of the things where you're in the zone and you love your life? Like, do you ever burn out? Um, when I do too many events, and I'll look, you know, months out, and I'll say, yeah, I'll do this, 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 and then the week it, it's happening, I go, oh, I overextended myself. Yeah. And so on weeks like that, I feel kind of over, I, I feel kind of burned out a little bit. Um, and then I'm also trying to make up for lost time because I work nights. You know, I don't see my wife and my 10-year-old all that often. So on the weekends, I'm trying to, to make up for lost time. And my son uh, plays hockey here in Chicago. And so we're, we're going on a lot of trips with him and doing that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm trying to make sure that the weekend, you know, we have plenty of family time too. But it makes it difficult when, uh, you know, I'm peeling away on a Saturday night and going and doing an event. But I wouldn't have it any other way. And I appreciate the fact that people want me to come um, help their event. And now let's talk about the sports scene in town. Would you agree that it has the best fans in all of America? Because maybe New York City has good fans, but I just think we're the most humble, likable, and passionate fans you will ever find. Well, I think well, I would agree with that, and, and Chicago sports fans are very passionate. I would also say that for provincial markets, you know, markets that are really unique, I'd say Philly, Boston, and Chicago. They love their sports. Yeah. They they love um, you know going to games and supporting their teams, and so I think I think those those markets in particular really have a passionate fan base no matter what the sport is. And here in Chicago, I mean, the Bears haven't been so good this year, so there's not a ton of interest in them. Uh, White Sox, you know, won a World Series 10 years ago, but but not really resonating that much. The Cubs came, you know, they, they really a year early, kind of matured a year early and, you know, were you know, made it to the uh, NLCS. And that was impressive. And then the Blackhawks have won three Stanley Cups in six years. So they're, I mean, I'm not just saying it because I'm a hockey guy, but I would say that, that uh, they kind of rule Chicago because of their success, because of their outreach with the community, and because they've gotten so many little kids to, to enjoy the game of hockey. And now it's, you're seeing it in, in, at the level my kid's at as a you know, 10-year-old, a squirt major. You're seeing some really good kids playing hockey and being having really competitive teams and being able to play with uh, – play with uh, kids all over North America because the game's gotten so popular. Now, you're a big hockey fan. Would you say that this sport is growing? Within the next five to ten years, how big could it be? Well, I think it depends on the market. I think it depends on um, marketing their stars. You know, the the Patrick Canes, I and mean, he has some, some, a lot of difficulty recently, uh, recently yeah. legally. Uh, but the guys playing lights out this year, you know, the Sidney Crosby's, the Taves, guys like that who you know, have a clean you know, reputation, who are great players and that sort of thing. Um, I would say that um, I, I would say that it's going to grow in the areas where the teams are good, like down in Tampa. It, it has a chance to grow because the Lightning are good. They made it to the Stanley Cup finals last year. Um, could they repeat that? Could they win a Stanley Cup or two? Possibly. But it's going to be popular in, you know, the Bostons and the Phillies and the Chicago's and the Detroit's and the Minnesota's, you know, and especially and obviously all through Canada as well, um, regardless. But if it grows in a place like Tampa or if it grows in a place like L.A., because L.A. has had some success over the past few years, yeah. that's good for the game. If it's growing in those markets and the New York Rangers, I mean, they've been very competitive for the last three, four years. And now I want to get your take on the Cubs because it was weird. Once I moved out of town, then they're back to being good. The vibe down here was all about could back to the future predict the World Series. That's all you heard in Tampa Bay because they're not Cub fans down here. Now up in the Midwest, was that the vibe? I think it was funny. I think it was funny because – because it was, uh, you know, as the date approached, you know, October was yeah. the 21st, uh, 2015, as the date approached, um, there was, you know, people were like, oh, wow, that's cool. But, I mean, people were talking about, hey, this is a new generation of Cubs players. You know, these all the talk about curses and all the other nonsense is just that. It's nonsense. And nobody believes, you know, I, I, don't, I think if, you're, if you really think about it, oh, they've, they've been bad for 108 years. They haven't won in the World Series in 108, 109 years. And, uh, and that's not because of curses. It's because they haven't been good, you know. And so if you take away all the excuses for poor performance and you just say, hey, we're going to go out there and play, and they got a lot of talented young kids 
who don't even care about that stuff. They just care about winning, and they're a really exciting team. And I think in the next year or two or three, um, I think they have a great chance to win the World Series. Did you get to meet any of the guys from the new Cubs squad this year? Um, I did not. I did not. I, I don't get out to the ballpark that often. Yeah. Um, but but they all, I mean, the, the guys that are covering them on a daily basis say they're really refreshing and they're real good guys and, and a lot of fun to cover and, like like I said, really talented and don't realize all the pressure that, that all the Cubs fans are putting on themselves and the team because they're just out there playing baseball. So Now, I want to get your take on the Bears because, once again, I'm not in town What's the vibe like? Are people mad at Jay, or is it this thing where we're just sort of content with what we're going to get out of him? And what's the vibe been like with John Fox? Because I watched the Bears out here, but it's about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So what's the vibe like for the Bears? Well, John Fox is very secretive, so his his media friendliness um, – is not very high, which I know people are like, well, tough for the media, except the fact that we're sort of the guys that bring home the stories that, that everybody gets. So if, 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 if they're not revealing much or they're not, you know, um, friendly to the media, that's, uh, it's, it's not necessarily a problem, but there's a lot better ways to do it. Uh, Jay Cutler has been much maligned for years and I got to say, they don't have a very good team this year. But Jay Cutler has—he's uh, made a mistake here or there, but he's been pretty good this year. Yeah. And and you hear that a lot now. I mean, the 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 narrative this year is, boy, Cutler, man, he's been bad for all these years, and he makes mistakes and he messes up the games. But you know what? He's had a pretty good year. And and I got to say, his performance, especially in fourth quarters, uh, in games that they would otherwise not be in, he's he's been a difference maker. So so the story is changing with Jay Cutler. Everybody like, oh, get rid of him, you know, kicking him to the curb. And and in years past, you could see why people would want to do that. And this year, without him, um, I don't think they have three wins. I mean, they're three and six. They're not exactly lighting it up or three and five. And but but without him, um, uh, they don't. They may they may not even have a win. Why did Brandon Marshall leave? Was it just like a breakup between him and Jay? Because I thought things were good. I just found it odd. I think uh, I think Brandon Marshall, the, the way that it's told me, and, I, and I've met him a couple of uh, occasions at charity events, but but not as they relate to the sporting world. Um, is you know he's a strong personality, and he had you know he's you know had a lot of opinions. And and was outspoken, and you know would speak the truth and that sort of thing, and and, and I'm not sure, um, you know, I don't, I'm not sure long term that was something maybe they wanted to deal with, but the guy's talented. I mean, he he was a horse. He was really good as a receiver, but um, the people that I that you know that I know that, that that cover the the Bears were like, you know, they they just wanted to move on and get younger, and they were rebuilding anyway. A guy like Brandon Marshall, who's in his 30s or whatever. Um, you know, in, in a rebuild situation, you know, maybe maybe they could give them a chance to win with another team. And what are some big events or big things going on in town in the next few months? Um, big events. Well, I mean, we got the the Christmas tree lighting in a few yeah. weeks. That's that's always a fun one. They moved it from Daily Plaza to Millennium Park, so that everybody's been chatting, you know, talking about that. And then, um, you know, the old Marshall Fields building that's now Macy's, they're talking about, is that going to still be around uh, in, the, in the coming months? And, um, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out where to put the Barack Obama presidential library when, when that uh, thing goes up, um, yeah. Washington or uh, Jefferson Park, um, Jackson Park. So I, I think it's, um, you know, th- those, are, those are some things kind of coming down the pike. And then, of course, politics, no matter, you know, it's it's a, a a national election coming up in a year, and so I think everybody's got their eye on you know who the who the the, the leaders are there. So I mean I think the presidential year is coming up, so that's always a big year. What is your take on this whole thing? I just find it bizarre. It seems weird to me that one of these guys could be our next president. It just it doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like real life to me. Well, it, it, the thing about uh, November a year out is a lot can change, and every presidential election a year out, it's you know, there, there's a lot of a, a lot of reporting on the candidates that still needs to be done. There's a lot of positions on on issues that need to be learned. I mean, we I mean, basically, you know, you see the Republicans a lot because you know um, they're the ones that have not been in the White House for eight years, and they have all these candidates, and and the deal is. Um, 
you know, they've been attacking each other. And, and now at some point they're going to have to start getting specific about how are you going to make the economy better? How are yeah. you going to – what are you going to do about immigration, um, education? I mean all, all the, the, big, um, the big issues. And so, and so now they're going to have to start getting specific. They're not going to be able to just attack each other and, you know, this guy's a bad guy and I'm a better guy than this person and whatever. So I think you have to remember you're a year away. And it seems yeah. like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe an election's coming up. But it's still a long time. And now before I let you go, I just want to get your take on the weather. I'll check the app and just see what it's like up in the Midwest. Are you a fan of the winter? Because that was one of the reasons why I wanted to move out. I love Chicago with all my heart, but, dude, I could not take negative 20-degree weather with snow, man. It's just – it wasn't my thing. I've, I've known half a dozen families in the past two years, personal like friends or acquaintances, who have moved to places like Florida, Texas – because of what you just said, because it's been so bad. And this year, because of El, uh, El Nino, I think it's going to be a more mild winter here, which is m- much appreciated. Um, but um, when it's bad, and it's been bad the past couple of years, yeah. it's bad. And it's miserable. And there's no way to you know sugarcoat that. I mean, that's it, it's awful. And so, um, yeah, it, it, I, I can understand why you would. And I think a lot of people could, too, because it's a real struggle in the wintertime. Dude, there's nothing worse than when you have to get up, let's say, 10 minutes earlier and turn on your car, and even then it's not warm. Like, remember by the skyline, it was just frozen Lake Michigan? I mean, that was an unreal polar vortex. I mean, that year, dude, we could not catch a break. It was bad. And and so I think that's why people are like, man, I, I got to come up with a better plan than this. And so, yeah. So I know some people that have moved to Florida. I know some people that have moved to Texas for that very reason. And now before I let you go, what do you guys have coming up tonight at 10? Uh, coming up tonight at 10, we have more Fox Lake revelations from uh, the, the Lieutenant Glenowitz investigation. So that's going to be interesting. Pam Zekman's doing a story on uh, our investigative reporter on uh, you know the bad nail salons or how they can you know you know be uh, you know unsanitary, etc. And um, so, but but I think I think the Fox Lake thing is 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 probably the the big one because that's the one that's really generated a lot of uh, interest from people not only in Chicago but nationwide. And now, where can people find your work online if they're not in the Midwest? Uh, well, listen, you can uh, you can follow me on Twitter at uh, Rob Johnson CBS Two. Uh, cbschicago.com website. You know, I've got stories you know here and there, and and on Facebook, uh, it's Rob Johnson. And um, so, yeah, that's that's where they can find me. And I'm always, uh, you know, looking for good story ideas and and and, and any ideas people might have. And, and so I'm, I'm always uh, looking for those. Well, keep up the good work, dude. I miss watching you guys at 10, but it's cool to see the tweet and keep up with everything online. So thank you for uh, coming on Happy Hour. It's been fun, bro. It's been great, Ryan. I appreciate it. I'm glad it worked out and uh, good luck with the with the uh, the podcast and everything, and, uh, and, and it's been uh, a lot of fun being on tonight. All right. Thank you, dude. All right. See you, man. All right. Bye. And that was Rob Johnson from CBS2 in Chicago. I grew up watching him, so to have him on the podcast was an absolute honor. This has been Hoppy Hour. I am your host, Ryan Hoppy, saying peace out. Happy Hour. Happy Hour. This is an official broadcast of Hoppy Radio. For more info, check out hoppyradio.com and hoppysworld.com.